We're back to thinking about um, infinities, and now we're actually going to start really talking about infinite sets. The key is the first way to talk about infinite sets is to think in the, the, with the cardinal notion of comparison and counting. And the notion of one-to-one -one correspondence as a way to tell when two sets have the same size uh, and to start comparing them, it applies to even, even to infinite sets. So some examples of infinite sets that we're going to be looking at. The natural numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. And I start that with 0, as most modern mathematicians do, uh, although a long time ago the people would have started with 1. There's good reasons to start with 0. The integers, that's just including the negative numbers and not just the, the non-negative ones. Okay. The rational numbers, um, all the ratios of integers, anything that can be expressed as a ratio of integers. The real numbers, the complex numbers, um, here's another infinite set, pairs of real numbers, where you pick two real numbers and put them together and think of the pair of two real numbers as one unit. Um, here's a more geometric example, points in the plane. Um, and one reason I, I mentioned these last three is that secretly these are all the same. And what do I mean by the same? I mean there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the three. A complex number, x plus i, y, has a real and imaginary part, x and y, well that's the same data as a pair of real numbers. And um, if you study the complex numbers, you or even pairs of real numbers, you talk about how a, plane, a point in the plane can be given coordinates, two real coordinates. So that's actually a very important, uh, simple example of three sets that are presented somewhat differently or described differently, but have exactly the same cardinality because there's a, a very straightforward one-to-one -one correspondence between those. So let me do a little historical interlude. This isn't primarily historical talk like most of mine. Um, uh, but I want to talk a tiny little bit about the situation of infinity before 1874, which is when Cantor really had his big breakthrough or published his big breakthrough about um, infinity. So infinity had been um, useful in, in a way, especially since the invention of calculus. Um, calculus is all about infinity in, in a way. It's all about limits and infinitesimals and taking the limit as quantities get extremely small or extremely large. But um, it was the, the, that aspect of calculus was always rather dubious and rather controversial. And in the early 18th century and even in the mid 18th century, people were um, discovering how to kind of rigorously take all the infinities and infinitesimals out of calculus and replace them with very concrete notion of limits. And that means taking a limit of bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger finite quantities, but never actually trying to say this is infinite or this is infinitesimal. Okay. So that's what I'm talking about here. In the early to middle 18th century, we've got a much sounder footing for calculus. Um, and infinity is just a trend, a goal, a direction to go in, but you never think of it as actually being reached. Um, and we're, you've got this wonderful uh, process, uh, this idea of a limit that uh, lets you talk about infinity as a goal but not an achieved quantity. So you never actually treat it as a quantity in itself or so people thought. Um, and certainly there was not, I don't think there was really an inkling that there could be a whole mathematics of infinity with m lots of different kinds of infinity, which is you know one of the amazing things that Cantor discovered that we'll see very soon. So. Um, Cantor was led to such ideas not because he just had this brainchild. Um, he really was studying a very concrete, well-known, famous problem. Um, and he was led almost inexorably to uh, the ideas of different kinds of infinity. Um, but I wanna, don't really want to talk about how he got it because it's, it's um, pretty intricate. Um, instead, let's look at just the basic idea of comparing infinite sets with the idea of one-to-one -one correspondence. And even at the very start, if you actually take it seriously, it, you discover some, some uh, very interesting and somewhat counterintuitive things that anybody could have discovered, not somebody as smart as Cantor, but nobody even really tried to think about, as far as I know. So here's two infinite sets, the natural numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, and the even natural numbers. Okay. So one thing is that one is a proper subset of the other one, meaning that you've actually gotten the even numbers by throwing away some of the natural numbers, but all of the even numbers are in fact natural numbers. So E is a subset of N, and it's proper just meaning it's not the whole thing. So a lot of our intuition would say, okay, it must be a smaller set. If there is any notion of comparing different kinds of infinity, 
Well, okay, maybe this is an example where there are two different kinds of infinity, and e is really smaller than n. But if we accept this idea of the one-to-one -one correspondence method for saying when two sets are the same size, then in fact we can show that they're the same size. Because here's a very simple one-to-one -one correspondence going from the natural numbers to the even numbers, just doubling. f of n equals 2n if you want it in formulas. But just double 0, you get 0. Double 1, you get 2. Double 2, you get 4. Double 3, you get 6. By definition, you're going to create exactly all the even numbers from that. And so um, each natural number corresponds to its double, the even numbers. Every even number gets hit. Nothing gets hit twice. Everything, li everything lines up. So if we accept this idea of a one-to-one -one correspondence, which seemed perfectly reasonable for finite sets, um, as saying that these are the same size, then we're saying that this set is the same size as a proper subset of itself. You can take this infinite set and throw away half of it, throw away the odd numbers, and yet get something the same size. And it turns out that for most purposes, that's, a, that's actually an, an accurate statement, even though it's somewhat counterintuitive. And what's counterintuitive here is that infinite sets behave in a weird way. Surprise, surprise, infinity is an interesting concept. Okay, so two, two notes about this. What's, one of the things that's going on, I don't want to talk about it too technically, but one of the things that allows us to have this situation is that the one-to-one -one correspondence method doesn't remember that we got E, the set E, as a subset of N. It kind of thinks of it as on its own terms, separate bags of objects. Here's the, here's the natural numbers, and here's the even numbers in separate bags. And it doesn't, we don't have to tell it, oh, by the way, the way I got E was I started with N and I threw stuff away. Okay? The correspondence method or the cardinality method of comparing things ignores all that structure very purposely and just says, okay, I can make a correspondence between 0 and 0, 1 and 2, 2 and 4, 3 and 6. Okay? Um, and then the, the, main, the main note is that, yeah, infinity is, is, uh, is slippery, th slippery stuff. You can throw away some or most, even, of an infinite set and still have something that's exactly the same size as what you started with. Um, and in fact, it's not an accident that this happened in this, in this case. An infinite set is exactly the kind of set where you can do that. Infinite sets can be characterized by saying that um, they're the kinds of sets where they can be equivalent, the same cardinality as a proper subset of itself. So what this suggests is, OK, this one-to-one -one correspondence method of saying when two sets have the same size seems very, very uh, loose and very generous. And maybe it's just always going to say infinite, infinity is infinity. Okay, That would be the simplest thing. And nobody had ever really thought about different kinds of infinity before. Okay, So we just saw how that is a little bit of a weird thing to say when you take a set and say it's equivalent to a proper subset of, it, subset of itself. But it really does turn out to be the right notion most of the time. Um, but if you if you look pre-Cantor, nobody was talking about, ooh, there's all kinds of different kinds of infinity. They didn't want to think about infinity as an object of study at all, okay? And so they didn't have a notion of different cardinalities, okay? So let's be let's have a little bit of terminology. Let's say a set with the cardinality of the natural numbers is called countably infinite. It's definitely an infinite set, um, but it's countable that it can be put in correspondence with our simplest example of an infinite set, the natural numbers. Okay. In other words, you can put them in a simple sequence. And notice there's a correspondence here between this cardinal method and the ordinal method, because putting things in a simple sequence, and basically taking some bag of objects and labeling them, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, everybody with a definite label, that's what it means to have a one-to-one -one correspondence with the integers, with the, with the, not, with the natural numbers. Um, that's exactly how you count things with the ordinal method. Okay, so it basically that would mean that the ordinal method and the cardinal method of comparing uh, sets and sizes, it, we know they give the same answer always for finite sets. Maybe they always give the same answer. Period. Well, the answer is no, they don't. Okay, um, and here's the argument that shows that. This is the big one that Cantor's most famous of the many things he's famous for. This is probably the biggest one he's famous for uh, in, among mathematicians. What we can show is that the reals, for example, the set of real numbers is strictly bigger than a bigger kind of infinity than the natural numbers. And it's a beautiful argument that I'll go through in a minute. It's an example of proof by contradiction, or at least the way I'm going to set it up, is a proof by contradiction. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to assume that the reals are countable, that you can make a list or a well-defined sequence of all the real numbers. 
Um, and in fact, let me actually prove something a little tiny bit uh, stronger than just saying the reals are a bigger infinity. I'm going to say, let's look at the set of real numbers just between 0 and 1. And um, I'm going to show that that's even a bigger infinity. Now, it turns out that that's not really different from the kind of infinity for all real numbers. But certainly, if I can prove that this one, just between 0 and 1, just that set of real numbers is bigger than the natural numbers, then all the real numbers are going to be bigger as well. Okay. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that that set of real numbers, just between 0 and 1, just the decimals, is countable. The reason for doing this, the reason for doing a proof by contradiction, which is assume the opposite of what you want to prove, and we're going to try and derive a contradiction from that. The reason you do that is if that kind of assumption makes things very much con more concrete and allows you to write something down and get a handle on things. This is a classic example where it's a really good idea to prove this by contradiction. So we're going to assume that it really is countable, and we're going to um, derive the fact that, in fact, that gives us a contradiction. So here's the, the power of that assumption. If I claim that the, the real numbers between 0 and 1 are countable, I should be able to actually produce a list of them. OK, so let's see. Suppose the first on the list were this decimal. And the dot, dot, dots means it goes on and on, maybe repeating, probably not, if it's irrational. Um, then a list like this, a decimal like this, decimal like this, decimal like this. OK, so imagine you have listed them in some order. doesn't matter what the order is. I'm going to show that no matter what order you could come up with, I can find something that can't possibly be on the list. Okay, so there's nothing special about the, the numbers here. I don't find any pattern here. I really purposely wrote them down random. Okay, so here's what we do. We start with by listing them. What we do is we extract what we could call the diagonal. The first decimal of the first thing in the list. The second decimal of the second thing in the list. The third decimal and the third thing, and so on. So you notice it goes diagonal down. This is why the method is called diagonalization. Okay, so that's the number 0.94235, etc. Okay, so what? Now here's the, the, the other cool part of it. Change each digit in a systematic way. So let's just add 1 to each digit, and let's have 9 wrap around to 0. Okay, And we just, it just, that does nothing special about that. It's just to have a definite um, kind of answer. Now the 9 has become a 0. 4 becomes 5. 2, 3, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's a new number. Let's see what's interesting about that number. Can this number be on the list? Well, let's see. Can it be the first number on the list? It doesn't look like the first number on the list, but let me tell you why. There's a very easy way to tell it couldn't possibly be, because it differs in the first digit. I specifically took a number that matched the first one in the first digit, maybe only there, but it does match that one, and I specifically changed it so it didn't match. Now, does it, is it, could it possibly be the second thing on the list? Nope, because I changed the 4 to a 5. Could it be number 3 on the list? Nope, because I changed the 2 to a 3, etc. There's no way it could be any number on that list, because the way of constructing it, of extracting the diagonal and then flipping digits, means that it doesn't match anything on the list. It doesn't match it at least in that one place, that diagonal uh, place. That's pretty cool. Okay, It cannot be anywhere on the list, and so that's the contradiction. I thought I was listing every single real number between 0 and 1. And assuming that I did that, I actually found a way to create yet a new one. Oh, oh, I guess that list couldn't have been complete after all. So this really shows that the real numbers are a strictly larger infinite set than the natural numbers. And again, that's maybe a little underwhelming given this the fact that um, we already saw that there was we, our intuition for infinite sets wasn't amazing with the example of the natural numbers and the, and the even numbers. But let's think about it. That told us that it seemed like the cardinality method was really likely to make things, to say things are the same size. And it was actually hard to construct things that were different kinds of infinity. And yet, even with that very loose, expansive notion of what same means, here's something that really isn't the same. Here's something that really is a bigger kind of infinity. And it's called an uncountable infinity. So the real numbers is an uncountable set. It cannot be put in a sequence, cannot be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers. That's pretty cool. And that's where I'll, where I'll, where I'll